Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Bojo, Wasena Do Dem, Fort William First Nation and Donjaba, Zongde and Dishnakaz. My name is Damian Lee, and I'd like to welcome here, you here today. I'd like to say miigwech to those beings that uh, are we asked to come here and share the space with us today. So miigwech, Diwednang, Wabnang, Zhao Nang, meanwhile, Epigenet, 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 sorry, uh, Beamed again. Uh, we welcome you to this territory, wherever you are today. And uh, I'm coming to you from my backyard in Nishinaabe territory uh, here in uh, Southern Ontario. So you've joined us today to, um, uh, for the conversation on generous futures, indigenous pr perspectives on decoloniz decolonizing. We're very excited to have this panel today and we can't wait to have the discussion. At this time, I'd like to pass it over to Elder Joanne, to Joanne Dallaire to open uh, the event with a, with a prayer. I'd like to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to come and open this event in a good way. And it's so important uh, to our indigenous community and to other communities. Um, it's really great that so many of you are here today and are interested and invested in change. And so I'd like to offer you a prayer. And I'm going to be announcing that my spirit name is Shadowhawk Woman. I'm from the Wolf Clan and I'm Omish Gigo, which is Swampy Cree. And I'll be doing that in my ancestral language of Cree. And then the rest will be in English. So here we go. Wachie. Adishnahasan Sahakutan. Kashishan Ishkul, my he can go damn Omashkigo. First of all, let us give thanks for this day that's been offered to us, this opportunity to continue opening our minds and opening our hearts to a new way of being and a new way of seeing. I ask that you watch over each of us today, our families and our loved ones. I also ask at this time that you watch over those people who are currently dealing with health concerns or COVID related issues. And for all those people who work so very hard behind the scenes, we thank them. I ask that you continue to watch over our brothers and sisters who are on our streets, in our jails, our institutions, hospitals, seniors' homes, shelters, and treatment centers. And let us give thanks for any plant and animal life that we will consume today that will give up themselves so that we can move forward. And for all those people who work so very hard behind the scenes to get our food ready for us, we thank them. Let us give thanks to Mother Earth and for all that she provides for us and beg for her forgiveness for how we treat her and pray for the healing of her waters. Let us give thanks to Father Sky who watches over us and tends to the star people, reminding us of the many things we must tend to in a day to Grandfather Son, who gives us the energy of life while reminding us too much of something good can be harmful. And to Grandmother Moon, for when she is full, lights our way in the darkness. And when she is in New Moon, reminds us that even in the darkness, the light is there. And she reminds us of the many phases we will go through in a month. I ask that each and every person listening today receives a message that makes them feel good about who they are and how they move into this world. And each of us is reminded that who we are today will not be who we are tomorrow. And I say, chimigwitch, 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 aho, all my relations, hi, hi. Thank you so very much for allowing me to be a part of this. And I wish you all a very good day. Take care, thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, Elder Joanne Dallaire. I'm pleased to be moderating this panel today in the Gen Generous Futures series. Generous Futures brings, the diverse, uh, brings diverse entity, uh, identities, experiences, and perspectives of the philanthropic community to the forefront. This is a uni unique series that explores how charitable giving, in char charitable giving in intersects with in and conflicts with Black leadership, women of color, newcomers, 2S LGBTQ plus communities, and Indigenous perspectives. Before we begin the discussion, I would like to thank our lead sponsor of the series, TD Bank Group. We're delighted that they have joined us on this journey of understanding. 
as you may know, June is National Indigenous Peoples Month or National, in, National Indigenous Pe uh, History Month. Um, today, we are shining a spotlight on the experiences of Indigenous peoples in charitable giving. You may also be aware that in late May 2020, 2021, the Sequoia Nation in Kamloops, British Columbia confirmed the presence of mass grave of children in their territory. This grave was found at the Kamloops in, in Indian Residential School. This set off a national process of truth telling that continues to unfold as we speak. It has, it has had wide, wide ranging impacts. At Ryerson, for example, it has pushed nearly 440 faculty and more than 300 staff members to refer to our university as, as X University in recognition that our namesake contributed to what later became the Indian residential school systems in Canada. I bring this up not only to set the context, but also because I believe phil philanthropy can learn from this moment. Whereas the statue of Edgerton Ryerson was pulled down through unsanctioned means, decolonial philanthropy too might need to color outside the lines if it's tru truly to, to support indigenous peoples. So today we'll be asking questions like, how can we better value indigenous reciprocity and in forms of giving? How do colonial ways of giving continue to harm and exclude indigenous peoples? What role, if any, does philanthropy play in reconciliation? How are indigenous led and indigenous supporting charities funded or unfunded? This discussion will explore how the charitable sector needs to address its savior, savior complex in order to move forward. Our panel of indigenous leaders will wade through these issues to bring some, some understanding to the current uh, realities that indigenous communities face. I will be posing questions following this and time permitting, I'll be asking our panelists to respond to questions submitted by you in advance. So today's discussion is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to you following the event. And I encourage you to share the video with all of your networks. Now I'm delighted to introduce our panel of leaders to you. First is uh, Sky Bridges. Sky Bridges became the CEO of the Winnipeg Foundation, Canada's first community foundation in April, 2021. Previously, as, previously he was the uh, Chief Operating officer, officer at the Aboriginal People's Television Network, or APTN, as Vice President of Business Development at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. He was instrumental in the development of Indigenous Day Live. Bridges also served on the board of the Winnipeg Folk Festival, It Gets Better Canada, and United Way Winnipeg. Welcome, Sky. Next, we have Bob Watts. Bob Watts is the chair of, of the board of the Gord Downey and Cheney Wenjack Fund, a graduate of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and fellow at the Harvard School of Harvard Law School, Bob has, has been involved in Indigenous issues for more than 30 years. Bob was the Chief, chief of Staff to the AFN National Chief, Perry Belgard. Sorry. He's, he's an adjunct professor and distinguished fellow at Queen's University and the School of P Policy Studies, and is a member of the year Leadership Council to McGill University's Institute for the Study of International Development Relations. He is also the Vice President of Indigenous Relations at the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. In addition, he advises corporations and governments on reconciliation and Indigenous strategy. Previously, he was Chief of Staff and Chief Executive Officer at the AFN, as I mentioned, and in term uh, ex Executive Director of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A former public servant, he was an Assistant Deputy Minister with the federal government and Senior Executive with the province of Ontario. He has taught, debated, and lectured at a number of universities in Canada and the United States and at the Canada School of Public Service. Bob is of Mohawk and Ojibwe ancestry and resides at the Six Nations Reserve. Welcome, Bob. And then last but not least, we have Chris Archie joining us today. Chris Archie is Sikwakmuk and uh, Sime, woman from uh, Seskin First Nation is passionate about heart-based community work and facilitating positive change. Chris is the chief, chief executive officer at the Circle of Philanthropy of, and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada, or otherwise known as the Circle. 
In all of her roles, Chris works to transform philanthropy and contribute to positive change by creating spaces of learning, relationship building, and activation. Welcome, Chris. So what an amazing panel we have with us today. I look forward to the conversation. In terms of structure, I'm going to be asking a number of questions. And uh, some of these questions are for the whole group and then some of the questions are for ind individual group members. And the very first question will be uh, a question to the whole group and I'll, we'll go through uh, in the following order. We'll start with Sky and then we'll go to Bob and then we'll go to Chris. And so the very first question that I will ask to the panel today um, is as follows. What is your first memory of generosity and how do, you, how do your memories influence your perspective on this topic? So we'll go with Sky first. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm coming to you live from Treaty One territory and homeland of the Métis Nation. Myself, I am Métis and I identify as Two-Spirit. And my earliest memory of generosity would be when I was uh, in line, I was quite young, uh, with my grandmother at the grocery store. And in, in front of us uh, was a, a lady and um, she was uh, going through the cashier and they got to the point where the cashier told her how much it was. And the lady said, I don't have enough. And uh, she started to put some of the, the groceries back and, and my grandmother you know, stopped her and, and said, uh, let me pay for that. And it always just struck me as a really young child about how um, generosity in the moment you know, when we see opportunities to help someone, to recognize that um, someone uh, is, is in a situation where they could be, lend a helping hand. And that's always stuck with me. And I've always, you know, looked through that throughout my life to see where I find myself in moments where um, there's an opportunity to help someone um, in, in a particular need at the time that I'm at. Thank you, Sky. Bob, let's turn to you. Thanks, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, bonjour, Sego, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this panel and to be part of this discussion more generally. Um, first memory of generosity. Um, I'm not too sure which one's really the first, but my, my grandfather was, he would always pick up hitchhikers. And I remember we were leaving Tynanega Reserve in Southern Ontario, my grandmother, my grandfather and I, and, um, and there was these two fellas out, uh, young guys who were hitchhiking and uh, they were kind of like rough looking, <laughs> looking fellas. And I don't think my grandmother really wanted my grandfather to pick them up, but nevertheless, that was his thing. He always picked up hitchhikers. So we picked up these, these two fellas and one of them was in really rough shape. He was really sick. And, uh, and, and my grandmother kind of responded to him almost immediately because uh, she always had things on her medicine and uh, both Western and, and uh, traditional. And she, she doctored that young man and took care of him. And uh, they stayed with us for a while. We fed them and made sure that, that they were taken care of. And <laughs> it was a good lesson for me. I, like I always recognize, um, you know, my, my Papa Jim, he would always do that sort of thing. But my grandmother, um, uh, in spite of, I think, her reluctance, in the first instance, she's seen that opportunity for her to engage with another person uh, in a generous and selfless way, and she did that. And and she, they, you know, I think it was only several hours, but I think it it changed life for those young people, and for me too, in terms of being able to witness that. Big watch, you know. Watch. So that's a very excellent story. Thank you for that. Uh, and we'll turn to Chris. Coach Jim, thank you. Welcome, um, everyone. I, When I first read this question, I was thinking about a story that I've told publicly a couple of times, and I'll share it again here, because I do think that it continues to give me lots of wisdom about the notion of um, the philanthropic sector today. So one of my first memories of generosity was being a little kid and being given a little cardboard box with a string that went around your neck and it was by UNICEF. And so there was a period of time, maybe it lasted a decade or so, young kids everywhere, I feel like it's dating myself, young kids everywhere were sent out during Halloween to do trick or treating and they were asked to ask for change and it would go in these little boxes. 
Um, and I remember being so moved because the presentation was that these were um, just mere pennies, but they would help create um, water wells in Africa. And I remembered being really proud about going home and like, you know, having this thing, getting ready to bring it out for Halloween. And my mom just, um, you know, saying how interesting it was that this money was being raised for kids in Africa when our reserve is 30 kilometers away and had been on a boil, boil water advisory. And I just remember being really confused, like, oh, yeah, I kind of didn't realize that I was just a kid. But I, I also remember it as um, I came to understand more about the desire to help others outside of our own country, um, even at eight or nine years old, being really irritated and confused. And I have to say that those feelings, um, they kind of stick around. I continue to have a little bit of that um, cranky irritation with me when I think about and talk about settler philanthropy. Um, but I, I will also just say that for me, one of the deepest acts of generosity that I get to witness is when my little brother goes deer hunting. Um, his, his ability to do that work is just a demonstration of abundance. Um, and it is his demonstration as well of being in relationship to creator, to our community and to the land. Um, and to me, that's what really, um, you know, deep indigenous led philanthropic behavior is about. Cook's Jim. Thank you so much for that. And uh, just to date myself too, I remember the little boxes for Halloween, the UNICEF boxes. I, I'm, I'm with you there. Thanks for that. So we're going to move now to uh, individual questions and we're going to follow the same order, uh, Sky, Bob, then Chris. And uh, there's two sets, two rounds of these questions. So we'll just start with uh, Sky. So Sky, the Winnipeg Foundation is celebrating 100 years of phil phil uh, philanthropy this year. That's an amazing milestone. Can you please tell us a bit about some of the initiatives that the Winnipeg Foundation supports and how these are contributing to the community? What are some of the challenges you're facing when it comes to supporting charities and groups serving Indigenous communities? Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, so, you know, as previously mentioned, I've only been in the role for two months now, and I'm learning a lot about the amazing impact that the Winnipeg Foundation has had in our community and the dedication uh, from the staff. And, uh, you know, shortly after TRC and calls to action, one of the items that the Winnipeg Foundation undertook was setting aside a million dollars to support um, the Indigenous community. Now, more recently, uh, some of the organizations that uh, we have supported is the Mama Way uh, Center, which provides support for the Survivor Network, and it's an organization of survivors and victims for families. We've also provided support to the Indigenous Women's Healing Center, which supports Indigenous women on healing and recovery from family violence, addiction, integration issues, and inst institutionalization, as well as the ICWE, uh, which supports women and their children, uh, ending family violence by offering shelter during crisis and uh, nurturing hope and change and empowerment and also the Clan Mothers Healing Village, uh, which provide midterm to long-term support to women who have been victims in multi-generational traumas. And then most recently, which I was really happy to be a part of on June the 21st, two days ago in recognition of National Indigenous Day, I was able uh, to witness a ceremony of the launch and creation of the Gathering Place, uh, which is an area within the Forks in Winnipeg, uh, where we help to support and create a traditional Indigenous healing lodge, which will be there to support learning and education, celebration, uh, and that lodge, or, or what is also called the wigwam, uh, it, it was is set up there in a good way, in a traditional way. And I have to say, it was truly remarkable to see this structure in place as an opportunity for healing. The second part of your question in terms of looking at the challenges that, uh, that we face in supporting Indigenous organizations, you know, um, the, the whole topic in looking at decolonization, every organization, every different um, Indigenous group, First Nation, Métis community, Inuit, is in their own journey in terms of what that looks like, and also at an individual level for Indigenous people. Um, within my own family, uh, my grandparents never wanted to admit that they were Indigenous. And so, you know, the, the process of this is different. There is no roadmap in terms of what this looks like. And so I think the challenge for organizations that support that is understanding that we are in a process of do capacity building. The movement you know, for indigenous people is they want to be at the center of um, self-determination 
in leading organizations that um, support this change. We certainly have um, organizations that are non-Indigenous led that still do very much important work. And so for uh, Canadian foundations and charities across Canada, I think it's more about understanding, you know, what are the root causes of where we are, where we are currently? It has taken hundreds of years to bring us here, and it's going to take many, many years and a few generations to pull us out of uh, where we have gotten to. And so the challenge is um, for charities to understand um, the systems uh, that have gotten us here and really kind of approach things differently in terms of a relationship, of consultation, of really understanding what community needs and how we can kind of fill that void in terms of capacity building. Thank you. Yeah, very complex. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll turn to Bob. So Bob, uh, the Gore Downey and Cheney Wenjack Fund is part of Gore Downey's legacy and is a collaboration with the Wenjack family. The fund aims to build cultural understanding and create reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Can you please tell us a bit, a bit more about the genesis of the fund and how it is helping to convene conversations about reconciliation? Great, uh, thanks for that uh, question. I had the opportunity to be on a, on a panel with Mike Downey the other day that uh, he gave some really interesting uh, insights into the, the genesis and, and hearing on CBC that story about uh, Cheney Winjack and how profoundly it affected Mike. And then he told Gord about it. And Gord was just, uh, he was, he couldn't understand that why he had never heard about this before and started his own sort of journey of investigation um, and, uh, and, and wrote these poems, turned them into songs. The final album uh, for the Tragically Hip uh, was the story of, of Cheney Winjack. And Cheney was a Anishinaabe boy born in a Goki post uh, on the Mount Martin Falls Reserve in 1954. Um, in 1963, nine years old, Cheney was sent to Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School in Kenora. Uh, when he was 12, Cheney ran away from that school, attempting to reunite with his family 600 kilometers uh, away up in uh, Agoki Post. Nine others ran away uh, that day. All but Cheney were caught within the first 24 hours. And Cheney's body was found beside the railway tracks uh, on October 22nd. Um, he had succumbed because of uh, uh, starvation and exposure. Um, so Gord was inspired to, to do something. And uh, he reached out to the Wenjack family um, and um, together, these two families, the Downey family and the Winjack family came together with this idea of education, of dealing in, in a small way with some of the legacy of uh, the Indian residential school system and colonization more, more generally. So it's a, it's a collaboration between these two beautiful families. Uh, the goal is to continue the conversation that began with Cheney Winjack's residential school story and to um, aid in our collective as a country reconciliation journey through awareness, education and action. So what we do as a fund is we provide access to educational material on the true history of Indian Indigenous peoples in Canada and the history and lasting impact of residential schools we work with schools right across the country in terms of helping to provide resources, including a curriculum. A number of just amazing schools and teachers have really um, uh, caught fire with this. And, uh, and we're hearing great you know, and beautiful stories from, uh, from students and also working um, with Corporate Canada in terms of the creation of legacy spaces within uh, within corporations to educate um, uh, corporate Canada about this uh, legacy. Um, I'll have to say, and this goes back to like when I think about Gord and watching the one documentary, um, one of the documentaries about him, there is one place in the documentary where he was um, uh, asked about um, work that he was doing. 
And at that point, because of brain cancer, he was really struggling. And he said, uh, he said, there's, there's something that's just it's so important. And, uh, and it's two words. Um, and he was struggling to find those two words. And he said, First Nations. And it was, <laughs> I just cried first time I watched that. And, uh, and, and to think of um, all, the, all the energy in the last uh, few years of his life that he put into this and the support and love from the Wenjack family to um, manifest this idea. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful vision to be part of. Hey, watch. Thank you for that. Uh, and then we'll turn to Chris. Chris, the circle has been doing incredible work to actively shift the language in the philanthropic sector, specifically working to distinguish between indigenous philanthropy and settler created philanthropy. Could you please tell us more about this and its importance? For sure, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think it's probably helpful to share just a little bit about our organization as well. So we are, the circle is not a philanthropic organization. We don't raise funds, we don't give grants. We are what I would call philanthropic adjacent. Our work is to help you know, help money flow from settler created philanthropy into indigenous led and indigenous informed organizations, whether they're qualified donees, registered charities or grassroots movements. Um, and so I think that this is important because um, the distinction between settler created philanthropy and indigenous philanthropy is one that's needed when we're talking and using the language of philanthropy. Uh, it predominantly suggests that the orientation is towards um, settlers. We're talking about wealthy white donors. Um, and I think that that's problematic because it doesn't mean that there's space for a conversation about indigenous philanthropic behavior. So settler created philanthropy is wealth that has been created on the lands and the backs of indigenous and or enslaved peoples, uh, whether here in this country or in other places. This is not just about where original endowments were created from resource extraction families, from merchanting families, et cetera. But it's also about um, understanding the way in which uh, investments continue to cause harm through investment strategies to indigenous peoples globally in other places as well to their lands their economies and their ways of life. Um, and so that to us is settler creative philanthropy. It is um, philanthropy that was created to provide tax benefit. It tends to have a lot of connection to the notion of morality and is very actually quite charity focused. For me and for the work that we're trying to do here, Indigenous philanthropy is a, is a way to acknowledge that Indigenous ways of giving, of generos generosity, of wealth redistribution have been happening since the beginning of time and they still exist. Um, and so, you know, Sky, when you're talking about um, the programs that you're supporting, that Winnipeg Foundation is supporting right now, those are fantastic examples in many ways of Indigenous philanthropic behavior. These are Indigenous people who came together around a particular cause or issue, who care a lot about and are responsive to a specific community or an issue, and they're taking action on it, and that action has benefits for generations to come. Um, and so, you know, we take the, the language that is being used quite seriously and we're trying to do what we can to influence the sector to recognize that in fact, indigenous philanthropic behavior still continues to exist. Um, that when we talk about indigenous philanthropy, we're not talking about money from settler philanthropy to indigenous communities. We're actually talking about decades and generations of laws and values and teachings that are continue to be alive today that no, not only benefit indigenous communities but actually if we look to education if we look to justice if we look to child welfare um, if we look to climate action that actually indigenous ways of giving and being um, have a benefit not only to our communities but broadly to others as well and i i also just wanted to add that there's another language piece that we've been really um focused in on so the, we, we actually try not to use too often the language of reconciliation. Um, we heard two years ago from Indigenous members that the language of reconciliation had been co-opted predominantly by the corporate sector and by settler-led organizations and institutions. And we were really asked to come up with another way of talking about what could be possible in the relationship between Indigenous organizations 
and the settler philanthropic sector. And so the language we use is of reciprocity. Reciprocity demonstrates a commitment to mutual benefit. It acknowledges that there is a power imbalance at play, but you can be in relationship to rectify it. Um, and it also is a, it's a fluid um, act that requires presence and connection. And so um, that's just something that, that we've been really focused in on is also you know, rethinking and trying to lay claim to different kinds of language that actually has a more accurate view of what we think could be possible. Thank you for that. I think it makes sense to uh, be on guard for how the state can winnow out or hollow out um, terms that Indigenous communities use to serve themselves. So that's very important. Thanks for that. Uh, we'll turn back to Sky. So we're about halfway now, halfway between uh, the, the kind of scheduled questions. So uh, we're going to go through one more uh, round of questions here before audience questions. And Sky is up first. So Sky, how is the legacy of separate Separating Indigenous peoples from their homes, families, and cultures through residential schools impacted the charitable sector. Where are the effects still being felt, and how can settlers, allies, com and communities and institutions address these effects? So this is a very complicated question, um, and but I'm going to try and and and, and simplify it because I think we sometimes get maybe overburdened or feeling overburdened by the immensity of the challenges that are before us. But um, the taking that first step is actually quite simple, right? And so, you know, I talked about consultation and, and, and having conversations with those Indigenous communities that you serve to really understand um, where are they currently at in terms of their needs? What has been the impact of the residential um, uh, schools within your area? I mean, you know, as Indigenous people, we use that as an umbrella term, but the reality is, is there is differences across this country in terms of, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, Chris also kind of, you know, touched on this in terms of, you know, like we're talking a lot about rebuilding and supporting, but, you know, going back into the reverse of this, ultimately, you know, where I want to see us go is understanding that every single culture has something incredibly beautiful about it to share. And Indigenous culture certainly has that. And I want us to be able to move to a place where um, we are recognizing the incredible gifts that the Indigenous culture has and how it can contribute to Canadian society and our community, and in particular, um, on the environment. Uh, we are not living in balance. There's lots of conversations happening around this, and I believe that there is a great contribution that Indigenous people can make in this dialogue in terms of moving forward. I mean, ultimately, uh, when first contact happened, it happened in a way that Indigenous people wanted a mutually beneficial relationship. That has not happened. So I think for charities, what it has placed them in a position of is we are often the, if you will, um, faster responders to community need, often where uh, maybe um, you know, government is slower. So that was why you know, a lot of community uh, foundations and charities were set up. It was a group of individuals who wanted to come together, who recognized the need. So I think that that stays the same, but what shifts uh, is for uh, conversations and moving forward with Indigenous people, charities have an opportunity to be an educator. Donors are interested in supporting community but it's going to involve opportunities of education. And I know that many of the donors are interested in wanting to understand more about how we can support and get through this. Um, it, it's heartbreaking you know, for me, um, knowing that what happened in Kamloops for indigenous people, we knew that was there. And it's taken this long to have a different dialogue with Canada in terms of understanding. But I think for charities, uh, these moments are very important to move the needle forward as people are now more um, attentive and aware of this issue because it is education and understanding. And ultimately, a lot of our conversations that we're having today is in that intellectual space. But I think we have to move into the heart. We have to make that journey. And that's going to involve being vulnerable, sitting with those Indigenous communities, but with the goal through that healing to understanding that, as I said, there are incredible gifts that the Indigenous culture has to share. And ultimately, I think that's what great is going to look like for this country. Thank you for the question. Thank you for that. Um, for the next question, I, I really like this next question for Bob. Uh, it speaks to structural issues. And so, Bob, 
Uh, are nonprofit boards structurally able to address colonization? Are there other models of governance or of charities? Sorry, are there other models of governance of charities that have uh, that you've seen that center Indigenous knowledge and practices? Thanks for that uh, question. You know, I, I really think we're at the beginning of a conversation about how nonprofit boards um, can structure themselves in a way that um, uh, seeks to decolonize themselves <clears throat> or to indigenize uh, certain certain practices. Um, I think some of the board structure is kind of inherently intertwined with institutional structure. And I think where we put these boards and institutions in terms of um, uh, the, the fabric of society is really important. Uh, to me, it's, it's difficult from an indigenous point of view to separate notions of generosity as an example from maybe some of the other grand, seven grandfather teachings like courage and bravery and, and, and wisdom. And to think about that in terms of how can boards, how can institutions structure themselves so we're making decisions in a manner that we're taking into account the effect of decision-making on seven generations from now. That's not just over the next uh, fiscal year or the next quarter, but it requires a different sort of, of uh, environment to be able to work within, probably something even generous to each other in terms of uh, consensus uh, building uh, in terms of uh, decision-making, bringing elders and other wisdom uh, keepers to the table to help orient uh, our, our structure. And, and, and I agree with, uh, uh, with previous speakers about sort of the incredible uh, examples of generosity and how it fits into whether it's the development of children or the development of society more generally um, and the importance uh, of that in terms of developing a community, developing family. You know, I think of, you know, one of Mohawk elder friend of mine talking about uh, the dish with one spoon um, treaty as a global economic model. And, and he just kind of blew my mind when he said that. And I, I said, I went, what do you mean? He said, well, you imagine the, the dish as the entire world. And, um, and you imagine the spoon really talking about what does the wise distribution of resources look like? And how can you do that in a way that is loving and generous and kind? So some of these attributes that are important in terms of how we make uh, decisions are fundamental to how we set up boards and, and institutions. But then he goes on to say, you know, in that bowl is also um, the, the next seven generations. So how does that wise distribution look like in terms of taking into account the next seven generations and the agency of the earth? So these are all questions that I think that, you know, just to sort of separate institution and separate board from, from community and from uh, uh, all of us individually and uh, collectively is, is, is really different because we really need these institutions to be reflective of, of uh, community and principle, principles and values that we hold, hold uh, to be sacred and, and important in terms of, of, uh, of, our, uh, of our societies. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is for Chris, but before I turn to Chris uh, with the question, I just want to see if you want to respond to the last couple of points that were raised. Chris. Tim, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just um, add a little bit more to this question about what's happening in the sector in response to um, the children that were found in to, um, to Kamloops. So that's um, inside of my traditional territory. And what I find really interesting is we have a couple of different responses in the philanthropic sector. So there are organizations who have spent time building relationships to Indigenous communities, and they have done the thing that makes a lot of sense, which is they have reached out, they've offered funds, they've offered support, um, and they have done what they can to support those organizations quickly with funds, um, 
for the, the good work that they're already doing. I think on the other hand, there are a group of philanthropic actors in the space who actually don't have those relationships and they've been shook very, very deeply to the core um, as it relates to this, this discovery for many Canadians, for myself, for my nation. We've always known those children were there. We, we know that there are far more than 215 in that, that site specifically, um, you know, that, that is that even that number is just such a, a, a non-important thing because that number is just the beginning. Um, so I think there are a community of folks who are really struggling because they're, they're, they've are they been shook to the core and they're trying to figure out what to do and they're drafting statements and they're taking so long to draft them. They don't mean anything by the time they get them out. They're doing things like reaching out to organizations or individuals, indigenous and non saying, oh my goodness, what can we do? What can we learn? They're scrambling to find indigenous um, you know, education and consultants to help them train their staff and train their board. I think there's a whole bunch of folks in the sector who are playing the catch up game. They have taken too long to recognize that it, the bigger risk to their organizations is that they have not prioritized building connection to indigenous communities. So it means that when something like this happens and you want to respond, you actually don't have the relationships to respond quickly and effectively. So in addition to that, um, I think that it it brings up the the difficulty that folks are having in supporting indigenous organizations. Many indigenous organizations who actually could make use of philanthropic dollars the most aren't eligible, not because it's not possible to hand over money and leave them be to do their good work, but it's because the philanthropic, the settler created philanthropic sector has actually created its own practices and policies that, that tie their hands um, to help support organizations. The other reality to recognize is that many um, land defense, child welfare, um, um, water protectors, um, human rights um, advocates, these are all people doing important work that could never get qualified as charitable, um, get their registered charitable status, because they're doing um, public policy and advocacy work. And so when we have a government that is actively causing harm to indigenous bodies and to our lands, it becomes very difficult to engage with the settler created philanthropic sector to get funds to continue that push because they wouldn't qualify. So it becomes important to think about how organizations kind of take a look at their own rules. They support donors to give directly rather than through intermediaries, um, that there are lots of other options there. And then just back to this question that you asked Bob about Indigenous governance. So there are Indigenous-led organizations who have been operating for decades. The, the Friendship Center movement um, is one example where most of the folks who are leading those organizations are women. Many of them own their own buildings and have been at the forefront of social innovation for many decades. Um, Indigenous-led governance structures have been denied, um, ignored, and pushed aside in favor of more Western approaches to governance. So if someone is looking to fund me and they go, oh, um, you know, your organization operates on a seasonal pathway and your staffing model is that each person stewards a particular season, it's going to take me a lot of time to explain to a funder why we do that, how that makes sense, versus if I just said, you know, I'm the CEO and I have directors and they do these jobs. Um, so I think there's there's something else to be done to make sure that that folks in the settler creative philanthropic sector are coming to understand indigenous models for governance and operations in our organizations have been here for a long time, uh, but they have been relegated to the back seat and they have been questioned as legitimate. So I feel excited that we're now having a, con a conversation that allows us to amplify and hold up indigenous ways of thinking and doing in our organizations. Christian. Thank you. I mean, you basically end answered uh, my, my next question, but just, just to make sure that uh, I don't cut you off, is there anything you want to speak to, to in terms of why it's important to make an, a space for Indigenous governance inside organizations or in terms of having that like Indigenous governance systems recognized by non-Indigenous uh, philanthropic uh, foundations? Yeah, I think um, one of the big things is folks will often say, well, you know, 
you know, indigenous organizations, they need more capacity. We need to help them write a better grant proposal. You know, they need, um, they need a better strategic plan and we'll help them find the right uh, advisor for it. Um, you know, if only they could keep their staff and it's like, well, actually what's happening is they're chronically underfunded. They don't have the organizational and operational support to do their good work because they're constantly having to prove over and over again to organizations who don't understand their worldview um, that they are legitimate, that they're doing good work. So the reason that I think it's important to have um, indigenous governance and operation models amplified is because then settler philanthropic communities can begin to recognize their legitimacy and actually fund and support those. So rather than, you know, an organization, and I know a few who actually run their boards in circle by consensus, you know, they, they do things in a very indigenous focused way. Um, their minutes reflect a Robert's rules of orders minutes because they're like, well, that's what we gotta do. Like that's what the government wants to see. That's what the CRA uh, has expects of us. Very few folks have the legal support to actually understand how they can shift their bylaws to reflect their existing practice. Um, very few organizations have the capacity to think about um, organizational structure and stability and embedding indigenous worldviews and practices because they're chronically underfunded. So I think, um, the value is not only to indigenous organizations to help support the flow of dollars more, but it's also because, for example, in our work, we have a seasonal pathway that, that helps us clarify what we're doing when and with whom and for what purpose. Um, that, for some reason, it really struck a chord with the settler creative philanthropic sector. They were so enamored by this idea that we might shift how we work based on how humans are in relationship to the land through each season. And what I keep saying is, um, you know, rather than try and put it inside of your organization, you could fund organizations like mine and other indigenous led organizations and allow us to do our good work, you will reap the benefits, it will come it will come to you in a different kind of way. Thank you for that. So we have about three minutes left before we move to close. And so we, I'm going to turn to maybe one uh, audience question, and we'll see how we do. But I'm going to this is basically posed to a specific panelist, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open it to the group and I'll start with Sky and then maybe we could wrap up from there. Um, and so the question goes as follows. Uh, what role does settler philanthropy play in addressing reparations and reconciliation? And are, are there any ethical limitations and concerns to be aware of? Sky, do you want to uh, address that? Sure. And I mean, Chris has already been touching on this in her, you know, previous answer. And, you know, I think, I guess, you know, from the lens of from the charitable sector is, you know, uh, moving a little bit more on risk, right? So uh, when you heard her talking about um, the fact that Indigenous led organizations approach things in a different way in terms of the, the example she gave around minutes and reporting. I think that we have to look at that in terms of how we are supporting um, those organizations, not just in dollars, but what are the reporting requirements? Do they actually fit and do they follow um, you know, Indigenous ways in terms of reporting. And, and you know, and, and kind of beyond that too, and talking about limitations, which was already, already raised, you know, the challenge right now is what is a qualified donee? Um, and then going back to my earlier, earlier comments about, you know, how do we support Indigenous organizations that may not have a charitable status in the case of, of, uh, of community foundations, which were required under the Tax Act to, uh, as a qualified donee, as having a charitable status. And so, you know, we've created a fund that helps um, organizations get that support to, to get that. And, and I think that, and that is being looked at in terms of a bill uh, that is going uh, through the government to look at this issue that would open this up so that, um, you know, we can address that. And, and so uh, that's just some of the things um, uh, that that need the work that needs to be done. And as I said, being uh, more comfortable with taking risk. You know, most of my career has been working within um, Indigenous organizations, APTM, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. And even in that role as an Indigenous-led organization, there was risks and programs that we had created that, in the end, community said, "You know what? This isn't working." And I think you have to be, you have to know that it's okay that, you know, through a proper consultation process and creating something that sometimes uh, you need to change direction on something. And so uh, being okay with that. Thanks, thanks for that. Bob, do you have a quick comment on the ethics of uh, philanthropy and reconciliation? 
Um, I don't know if this goes specific to that, but I, I think we're going to see a sea change in how, how we work through some of these issues. I mean, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People just got through the Senate. So trying to imagine what does a Charities Act look like if it's informed by Indigenous self-determination and principles of Indigenous self-government and principles of Indigenous generosity, what does that look like? Because legislation is supposed to be consistent with those ideals in the UN Declaration and an Indigenous view on human rights from an individual and a collective basis. So I think there's opportunities that are on the horizon for us to explore all of these channels and to see our own institutions, whether they be um, uh, nonprofit or, or, or charitable, um, or just uh, community-based organizations that are doing the good work that other speakers have, have described. Um, and how do we honor and respect that um, in a manner that allows them to, to, to thrive? So and I think we're on the horizon of, uh, we're going to discover new things and new possibilities uh, as we work through the implementation of, of, of UNDRIP. Thanks, that's a good point. Uh, Chris, any final thoughts on uh, ethics and philanthropy in this context? Oh my goodness, so many, but I'll keep it short. Um, I mean, definitely, I think settler philanthropy has a major role to play in addressing reparations and reconciliation in this country. Um, you know, foundations help fund Indian residential schools and medical research. That is undeniable. There are only a small amount of organizations who've done that research, but I guarantee you it is uh, it exists both in corporate philanthropy and in especially community foundation movements. So it's important to like reckon with that and understand what that means for, for communities and for organizations. Um, but as well, I think that, you know, all, um, all folks who have wealth can take the time to understand the origin story of their their wealth creation, right? So how is their wealth created and generated? Uh, you know, who were the beneficiary or who were the benefactors of the endowments that were built? Um, who is it that um, has DAFs and how is it that they're actually using them more as a tax shelter rather than actually an active philanthropic giving? Um, so understanding wealth creation, understanding as well how investments and investment strategies continue to cause harm and how you can reduce harm through looking at various screenings, whether it's using UNDRIP as a screen or reconciliation as a screen, et cetera. Those screening tools do exist. You can ask your investment managers for them. Um, but I think as well, you know, there's some fantastic work that has been done by Yellowhead Institute. Take a look at land back, take a look at cash back. Uh, if you want just a glimpse into some of the ways that settler philanthropy can start to unpack um, its role in this, um, in the world that we have today. Thank you for that. Uh, so we're moving to close the session now, and just a few uh, few last pieces before we uh, let everybody go for today. I'd like to close by um, basically asking the panelists to give us one statement that gets to the heart of their perspective on the future of generosity. And I'm going to go in reverse order this time, just to mix it up. So Chris, that's 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 you since you were uh, already warmed up and and speaking. I think um, today I'm wearing earrings that have beaver fur on them. And I think one of the things that this reminds me about is the way in which beavers um, are ethical stewards of the resources they have available and they build for multiple generations. I think that there are multitudes of teachings and laws that actually can benefit our communities and other, other communities across this country. Um, and so that's what I get excited about, helping to create that kind of a future. Yeah. Thanks. Bob, you want to last one last word on the future? I think we're going to have this interesting mix of reconciliation, equity, um, uh, diversity, inclusion in terms of how we think about uh, uh, all of these things. There's been far too many people, Indigenous people in particular, that have been left out of the equation in terms of thinking through these and uh, to figure out ways of centering uh, the Indigenous experience in, in ways of thinking about giving and reparations and uh, reconciliation more generally, I think is going to be a great challenge for, for us to work through. But that's, that's part of this work that Mikhail Jean talked about in terms of confronting these uncomfortable truths and building a future together. Thanks. That's, uh, yeah, that's very important. Uh, Sky, last word. Well, thank you. Uh, I believe it's moving into Indigenous actualization. 
there has been a great tremendous shift in terms of way of the generations. As I mentioned earlier, my own grandparents wouldn't admit that they are Indigenous. But now here we are culturally. I think many of you are familiar with a tribe called Red, who takes Indigenous music and mixes it mixes it with creating a new form of, 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 of uh, digital uh, music uh, powwow step. And so I think that that embodies where we are going. It is self-actualization and an acknowledgement that there is a great contribution that Indigenous culture has to play in defining what Canada is. That's a strong point. Thank you so much for that. And I'd like to thank the panel altogether, Sky, Bob and Chris for uh, joining us today. It's a really, really great discussion, very important and timely one as well. And a huge thank you to our lead sponsor uh, of the Generous Futures panel series, uh, TD Bank Group. Your leadership has, is truly commendable in this, um, this work today. Thank you as well to the promotional partners, the Associ Association of Fundraising Professionals Greater Toronto Chapter, uh, Canadian Association of Gift Planners, Canada Helps, and Imagine Canada. And thank you for to our audience for joining us. This is this is why we're here today to, to share share with you. So please thank you thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, please look out for an email in your inbox in the coming days with a link to the recording of today's session. Uh, and please again uh, feel free to share it with your networks. Today marks the last event in the Generous Futures uh, virtual panel series. On behalf of all of us. Thank you to everyone for, for uh, participating in this journey of understanding and for joining us today. Uh, the alumni relations team at Ryerson University or X University is planning season two of the Generous Futures series, which will kick off in fall 2021. Details about that next series of, of panel discussions will be shared at a future date. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great day. <laughs>